For today's video, this is going to be my look at the demo showcase from the Women-Led Games event, featuring all the demos we played and enjoyed from it. So sit back, relax, and here are my favorites. We're starting things off a little bit on the cozy side with Gordlets. This is a very casual kind of sandbox city builder. Your job is to build cute little homes and places for the Gordlets to go about their daily lives. As you put objects down, they will walk around and track, go into homes, and you can also build the furniture or the interior of all the buildings. If you're hoping for any kind of progression or challenge, this is not that game. This is entirely sandbox driven, but it felt very adorable and cute. So this one gets on the list for someone who's looking for a very casual game, something to kind of just, I guess, whittle away the afternoons with your gordlets too. And now we switch to something that is definitely not casual, and that is Union of Gnomes. This is a deck building roguelike. When the gnomes have rebelled against Snow White and the Fantasy Kingdom, they are going to stage a revolt, collect all their little helpers, and try and build things up. This is a kind of deck building rogue light. As you'll collect different hero archetypes, that's the character who's kind of pulling the wagon, this determines what cards they have access to. If characters survive their runs, you can add kind of modifiers and boosts to their stats. But the cards themselves are represented by different gnomes that you can find, and you can modify decks with them. The twist of the deck building in this is that your mana doesn't come back as readily compared to other deck builders. You'll gain one mana point on each new turn, but there's a lot of cards that are designed to recover mana, perhaps at the expense of armor, a card discard, and etc. And the challenge is that you need more mana. You need to have a huge collection of mana on each turn, because of how card synergies play out. One of the big ones from the demo is the ability to set up for a critical hit. Critical hits can also proc specific card effects, but you see, because it only lasts for either one turn or some will only last for a single hit, you need enough mana in order to kind of get those big plays. And if you don't get them, these enemies become very frustrating to kill. And this kind of represents my big issue with the game at the moment. The balance doesn't feel good in this one, at least from the demo. A lot of your cards just don't really do enough. They're not worth it to play compared to some of the other ones. Any cards that kind of proc off of critical or status ailments are very important, as well as any cards that give you armor or recover your mana. One of the biggest tips I can give you if you want to play this one for yourself, if you do have a card that grants you mana, get that thing upgraded ASAP. Because the upgraded version will oftentimes give you two mana, and that can be enough to at least have more of a play on your next turn. Because again, if you start a turn not at full mana, you are in big trouble. And it felt like some of the enemy powers and abilities were just a little too annoying. The boss of the demo is just a constant scale with her units, like they just keep growing more and more damage. And then she also debuffs you so you can't hit. So the minions that get summoned just keep escalating in terms of damage and then they just kill you in one or two hits. And it didn't feel like there was anything that I could have done given the cards that I had to get through it. Still, for the demo, there is a lot to like here. Again, the aesthetics and the art style are very charming, and there is certainly potential. If they can balance things out a little bit better for the retail version, this could be a very solid deck-building roguelike for fans of gnomes, I guess, going out and doing whatever. And now we switch over to a Copper Fields. This is an action-adventure platformer. It is some kind of dystopic future. All life on the planet is gone. But we play as what appears to be a robot with perhaps the last tree or last plant that is still around. 
and we are going to go on a strange and wondrous adventure with lots of jumping, rolling, and perhaps some scares along the way. The puzzle platforming in this one revolves around you getting around the various obstacles in the world. You can only take one hit by default, but you can find water to kind of feed to your plant that will give it an extra hit. Upgrades come in the form of arm attachments that will enable you to do different things when you're interacting with the world. And your jumping is kind of built on you holding out the button to charge it. You can bounce off walls almost like a pogo stick. And you're going to have to get from point A to point B in a very beautiful and, well, dying world. From our time in the demo, it's hard to tell where the difficulty is going to end up in this one. It can be sometimes hard to kind of see an attack coming if you're running at full speed. There are going to be some chase sections. I do not know if there'll be any kind of direct combat in it. But this one certainly looks like it's going to be a very charming and very aesthetically pleasing platformer. So, if you haven't gotten tired of jumping, bouncing, and more jumping yet, then at least give this demo a try. We go from very quiet to rockin' loud with Munch. This is an action roguelike that feels like a combination of Hades and Brutal Legend. We play a creature who's trying to bring back heavy metal to the land. We're going to do that by ripping and tearing, eating, and evolving. As you kill enemies, they'll turn to a gibs or jibs that you can then eat. When you eat enough, your character will evolve, taking on a new form, gaining a new ability, and becoming more and more metal looking as the game goes on. The kind of goal here is that as you play, you'll be able to get different upgrades. This will allow you to customize your character, and you're trying to get from one end of the run to the next. I love the aesthetics of this one. Again, really going for like Lovecraftian metal. My main issue is that combat does not feel good, or at least it didn't feel right when we played it. The problem is that enemies do not get hit stunned. So when you're trying to hit an enemy, they can just smack you almost immediately. So the strategy, at least from the demo, was to focus on heavy attacks to kind of overwhelm the enemy and then try to immediately dodge out of the way and hope you don't get hit by some of their very wide attacks. And this kind of breaks down when there's multiple enemies attacking you and they can hit stun you, but you can't do it to them. And if they can make the combat feel better and kind of get it in sync with our metal brutality, this could be a fantastic action roguelike to chomp down on. So I would at least give this demo a try if you like headbanging and, well, fist punching or biting to go with it. And now we switch to something I think a little bit more cozy than our last game, and that is Potions A Curious Tale. Now, this one is already out, but this is the demo that we play from the event. This is a adventure kind of management slice of life game where you play as Luna, an apprentice witch who has come to an island to study from her grandmother the fine art of alchemy. And along with her familiar cat, she's going to get into strange adventures, learn a little bit about life along the way, and try to become a full-fledged witch in the process. Our gameplay here is of kind of the exploration slice of life variety. You'll create potions from various ingredients and reagents you find in the world. Every item has kind of an elemental affinity that can basically be used in the different potions. So there's multiple things that would give you fire or air or water and so on. And then you craft said potions and they'll be used for everything from puzzle solving to combat. There is a story to follow, but you are free to explore the world as you see fit. Now, at the beginning of the game, it can feel a little bit cumbersome having to keep going back and forth creating potions, as all your potions are consumable. So if you run out, your only option is to immediately go back home, craft some more, and head back out. But there is certainly a lot of charm to this one. And I would say if you like, again, like the slice of life style games, Again, more on the cozier side, I don't expect to see this turn into like Dark Souls or Elden Ring at any point during the play. Then definitely give this one a try. 
It wouldn't be a festival if we didn't have a bullet heaven to cover. And this one is... Frog-like? Frog-like? One of those two. This is a bullet heaven where, as the title suggests, we play a frog. Who is trying to eat as many flies and bugs in the swamp as one can get. Your job is to, well, keep them alive, upgrade their tongue to various capabilities, and get all that sweet, sweet progression. As a kind of twist on the formula, instead of surviving for like 20 minutes at a time, each wave is about, I think it was like 3-5 to five minutes long, and you'll choose kind of modifiers or conditions for the next wave. The idea is that you're kind of following a story, and each chapter goes in a different direction. I like the aesthetics of this one, with just like the kind of like a frog fractions, but with a lot of, again, tongue shooting out, as you can see. Now, with that said, this is still more on the traditional bullet heaven side, so you're not going to be aiming. It doesn't seem like you're going to be doing a lot of like hands-on play other than just moving around and trying to avoid bugs that are coming at you. So if you do like more on the, again, older or I guess one quote traditional bullet heavens, I would give this one a try. But if you're hoping for one that's kind of going to move things forward, I don't know there's enough hop in this one for you. And now we switch over to Reality Break. As a point of clarification, the footage you're seeing is taken from the build that I have access to via the IGF judging. But the demo itself was available from the women-led games event and well, I'm including it here. This is an action RPG, kind of reminds me in terms of control of that of Drox Operative. You are a lone mercenary in space when you get one very strange job to transport a mysterious artifact that soon bonds to you. And suddenly the entire universe is now up for grabs with your ability to rewrite reality. The game's twist is that Besides finding gear of varying rarities and pieces for your ship, you also get resources that allow you to break reality in various ways. This can be changing the properties of an item to make it more powerful, to literally changing an item so that it will fit on whatever ship you're using. As you play through, you also have the option to restart, which will kind of reward you a meta currency, which in turn will allow you to change the entire laws of the universe going forward, adding in new enemy types, new events that can happen, and is used for kind of the overall story progression. I really like this one a lot, and the only reason why I don't play it more on stream is because A, I'm still playing kind of my early build, and B, I don't want to burn out on it while the game is not fully done. This one is definitely a must play if you enjoy kind of space ARPG design and looking for a new one to get lost in. And now we turn to Sorry Rear Closed. This is a kind of survival horror throwback to kind of like the PlayStation 2 era with fixed cameras, stationary shooting, and lots of horror. One night, we are awoken by a strange demon who is looking for love and connection, who curses us with a mysterious third eye. And from there, we find ourselves trapped in strange dimensions, monsters are going to try and kill us, and it's up to us to figure out how to break the curse and survive each night. The kind of major mechanic of this game is that you can open your third eye at any time. When you do this, Kind of like the evil other version of the area dissipates for more of a normal one. And this will affect what objects and areas you can interact with at any time. Combat is all played in first person. And how it works is that when you're aiming in third eye mode, you can only hit the enemy in their weak point as represented by the heart on them. This will allow you to kill an enemy far faster, but you must be good at aiming. As the game goes on, you'll get access to different weapons, you'll be solving all kinds of survival horror related puzzles, needing items and moving here and throw and combining. Now from the demo, one thing that I wasn't sure of is if every enemy is in fact killable. I ran into kind of a larger class enemy and no matter how many times I shot them in their weak points, they were not going down. So you may have to just run away from some enemies and just try and get around them to do your puzzle solving. The story looks like it's going to be very interesting to play, and I am 
intrigued to see where it will all lead. So, if you enjoy your survival horror in the kind of PlayStation 2 that early era, then you definitely want to give this one a check. And now we turn to something a lot more cozy with Bubblegum Galaxy. This is a kind of puzzle meets city builder style game. It was our first day of the job at a company that builds galaxies and we accidentally delete the entire galaxy we're in. In order to fix things, we must rebuild things one planet at a time. Unfortunately, we're not going to be doing things like Kanamari and rolling up objects. Instead, our job is to mix and match varying tiles. Each tile will give a corresponding number of points, and you want as many points as you can in order to kind of fulfill the qualifications or the requirements for that planet. Each plan will also come with specific bonus objectives, such as getting a certain number of forest tiles, or a certain number of purple tiles, and so on, that you'll need to achieve to get stars, which also act as the progression gates to get to more planets. The rules are that tiles score better when they're near similar tiles, either because of the same color, or they have the same objects on them. And in order to unlock more tiles and thereby a higher chance of scoring, you must complete these bonus objectives as well. Now, in terms of complexity, I don't know how far the game is going to get in the main version. It seems like this is going to be more on the cozy, relaxing side. Unless you're going for all challenges, then it can certainly get a little bit tricky. But I like the story, and once again, the aesthetics and art style are great. So if you're looking for a little bit of planet building and puzzle solving to go with it, then you should definitely keep an eye out for it. And now we turn to Foul Damage. This is a kind of puzzle platformer we play as the most unusual of platforming heroes, an egg. We seem to escape from some kind of containment into a strange world. Why are we here? What came first? Why are there giant robots trying to stop us? We may never know, but we're going to have to run or roll and jump our way to maybe solve the mystery. So the kind of twist of Foul Damage's platforming is that as an egg, you can't hit any object while you're jumping, nor can you fall from too far of a height or you'll, well, crack. So the challenge here is that you need to figure out where to jump that will allow you to either gain elevation or lower yourself down in each room. There is bonus challenges in the form of gathering various feathers, and you'll have to deal with ever escalating elements of platforms, perhaps enemies, and puzzles along the way. Now, it does not seem like we're going to get any kind of like upgrades. I don't think our egg is going to unlock a jetpack or a grappling hook. I am curious to see how far this game is going to go in terms of complexity and environmental hazards. But I really enjoyed what I was seeing here. So if you're looking for a puzzle platformer that's going to give you a lot of yokes along the way, then definitely check it out. And now we turn to Cyber Paradise, an action roguelite, where our story is that we learn that we are quite literally in a simulation. When we die, our data gets deleted. But we play as a cyber hacker who has learned how to manipulate the world in order to recover those who have been lost and find memories that have gone missing. And for our first story, we are trying to get the memory of a dog who has passed away, and we're going to do that by hacking and slashing our way across the dark web, using our own dog as both emotional support and parry device. By petting your dog, you can parry bullets, which I'm sure is a very useful skill which we could use in real life. Our gameplay here is again, pure action rogue light. You'll explore the world, beating up enemies, gaining items and resources that you can use to unlock new weapons and features outside. There is a card upgrade system that lets you improve your character, but we did not get to see that in the demo. It is a very early alpha one. But the gameplay felt charming, and it did seem good to play, especially using the parry in your attacks. It's another one where I'm curious to see where we'll all lead, but I would say give this one a check if you're a dog lover looking for a little bit of rogue lighting to do. And now we turn to Kamaru, a frog refuge. This is a kind of cozy, somewhat like management sim-esque kind of game. 
you have decided to team up with your childhood friend to start a frog sanctuary. And to do that, you must build various places for your frogs to come, relax, and uh, frolly and hop around, feed them various assortments of bugs to get them happy, and try to build back the native land and marshlands along the way. The gameplay here is definitely on the kind of casual, very low stakes side. You'll feed your frogs in order to get them to like you, in order to take pictures, and have them kind of stay at your sanctuary. You can then buy items to kind of make them happier, as well as buy plants and stuff to grow in the marshlands. Those will allow you to get access to new bugs, as well as various berries that you can turn to jam, which you will then sell in order to buy more stuff. This one is definitely going to be on the wholesome variety, and while it doesn't look like it's going to be too challenging to play, this could be a really great game to once again just kind of zone out and relax too. So while it may be a little too basic for me to jump for joy about, if you enjoy frogs and looking for a very nice game to play, then definitely check it out. And now we turn to a game that appears wholesome at first look, but could be hiding something far darker, with Everholm. We have gone in search of our missing sister, and we end up on an island with no memory how we got here, a farm that needs raising crops that need to be grown, and a mysterious woods with monsters in it and things that are trying to hurt us. So this could very well be the prequel to Darkest Dungeon, I'm not 100% sure. But the game itself is kind of positioning itself in that slice of life kind of open-ended RPG style. You'll be able to spend your days talking with the various inhabitants of the island, growing crops, selling them for money to get more upgrades, produce more things, and at nighttime going into the mysterious woods with sword in hand and trying to fight enemies and uncover what happened to your missing sister. I love the pixel art in this one, especially some of the buildings and the background design. The gameplay here, it's kind of hard to tell, at least from what we play in the demo, as to where it's going to end up. Is this going to be more farming sim with light combat, combat focused but with the farming as a backup, or some other combination? But if you enjoy the kind of slice, pun intended, of life of, say, Stardew Valley, and looking for another game too, do some farming, slashing, and hacking with, then I definitely recommend you check this one out. And now we turn to Miniatures. This is a short form anthology adventure game where you'll go through different stories that relate to some strange thing that's going on. In the story that we were playing, it feels like we're building the most cursed IKEA piece of furniture out there. I love the animation and the art style of this one. Now as for the gameplay, it appears to be essentially like a series of little mini games or mini puzzles that will tell a greater story as to what is going on. Now how advanced this game gets, I have no idea. But it looks very charming, weird, and mysterious, and all that all at once. So if you're looking for a very short form, and I do mean short form, as the sword pages will probably be about an hour long at most, adventure game to play, then you should at least give this one a shot. And now we turn to Paris, Transylvania, where we play as Marie Antoinette, that instead of uh, meeting her fate at the guillotine, has fled to Transylvania in order to hunt vampires. There is a sense I think none of you could have expected where it was going to go. Our gameplay here is of the Peggle slash Peglin variety, as you'll use very different kinds of balls to shoot through the points here. Any point or target you hit will reward you with damage or defense based on the projectile you threw. Some projectiles can affect the board itself, and you'll be able to find more as well as relics along the way. This one seemed cute, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure if there will be any like depth to this beyond just shoot the item and then let it do its thing. Seemed charming enough, and if you're someone who has gotten tired of Peggle, Peglin, and anything else that involves pegs with it, I would give this one a try. But if you're looking for kind of a more deeper take on it and haven't played at least Peglin yet, I would at least recommend looking at that one first. 
And now we turn to Grimoire Groves. This is a kind of cozy roguelite that involves a lot of gardening and plants. We play as an apprentice witch who has come to a mysterious forest in order to figure out what is going on, and they must befriend every animal, plant, flower, and perhaps god that resides there. Our kind of gameplay here is about giving the right color energy to the flowers that demand it. Once you kind of have one like attached to you, you must give them enough energy to make them happy and kind of like let go of their advance. If you give them the wrong color or you get too far away from them, they'll become sad and will kind of sap your emotional energy. The loop here is that as you plant various flowers in your own garden slash farm, this will kind of reflect and change the forest, adding in new flowers, new events, and so on. Using the resources you collect, you'll be also able to unlock permanent upgrades, such as new spells, new colors, etc., which you will then use to explore more and rinse and repeat. I really like the the very bright and colorful aesthetic and art style of this one. It can be like a little overwhelming at times if you're not used to it. But this one certainly looks like it's going to be kind of like on a later roguelite side. So if you're someone who likes like super hardcore play of like a Dead Cells or Haze variety, this one may be a little too simple in that respect. But if you enjoy that design, looking for one that is far easier to learn and play, and one where there is certainly far less killing to go around, then you should definitely check this one out. And now up is Bug and Seek. This is, I guess, Stardew Valley meets Entomology. You play an avid bug collector as come to a quaint little town who is, well, very obsessed with bugs. And it's up to you to go out and catch a wide variety of them, reopen the bug museum, learn about the mysterious great bug heist, and maybe just live a nice cozy life. We're skipping farming, combat, and whatnot for, well, bug collecting. You'll go out every day using your trusty bug catching net to find bugs all here and there, under rocks, trees, benches, trash cans, whatever. And people will also require different bugs if you want to complete certain quests. And the more bugs you get, the more you can fill your museum. People will pay to see them, and you'll be able to get more money, buy more cages or uh, glass containers, and so on. This one is certainly not looking to be a high-stakes game. This is not going to turn into Earth Defense Force at any point. But another just very cozy, very relaxing game. So if you don't mind bugs and looking for something to unwind to, then you should do some seeking of your own. We now have the Good Ghouls. This is a beat em up game where you play as two radical teenage monsters. When they unwittingly unleash the Necronomicon on the internet, all the robots in the town become evil, and it's up to us to figure out what is happening by punching and beating up lots and lots of bots. The game kind of splits between beat-em-up sections and adventure sections as you'll solve simple puzzles to get the clues that you need to move things along. I really like the art and the aesthetics of this game, there's some really nice animation to everything. My main issue with it is the beat-em-up. The combat doesn't feel good to me as we played it. The issue comes in with how enemies do not get hit stunned, so once they initiate their attack, you are going to get hit by it. You have a dodge, but it's kind of unreliable. And a lot of your heavier moves just leave you vulnerable way too much for them to be practical in the game itself. I found that the best strategy was to keep doing ground stomps in the air and jump kicks, which do the most damage and leave you perfectly safe. The game is definitely lacking in terms of kind of like the great feel of combat, from games like Streets of Rage, TMNT, and those kinds. If they can improve the combat, this could be a really solid two-player co-op game to enjoy. But right now, I would give this one maybe a check if you're looking for a beam up that has some potential. And now for a game that may not look as heavy as our last game, but it is certainly going to be on the challenging side. And that is Packeret 
Down the Bunburrows. I think I butchered that name. This is a pathfinding based puzzle game. You are trying to catch as many cute bunny rabbits as you can. And to do that, you must use your puzzle solving skills and pathfinding to lure them into specific spots in order to catch them. How this works is that the behavior of the rabbits will go in a specific direction provided they have vision. If they know that a wall or a path is a dead end, they're not going to go that way. So you need to place down traps and move them in such an alignment that it will send them into the cage or just into a dead end for you to catch. This is one of those games that starts off very, very cute and innocent, and then becomes more and more brain melty as it goes along. And yes, this is a game that, as the footage you're seeing, it can take quite a bit to catch some of these rabbits as you're trying to figure out what you're trying to do. As the game goes on, they'll be introduced to using more cages, more rabbits in a level, and there are hidden challenges and bonus ones as well. So this is one definitely for the puzzle fans who like some brain melty challenges and really love bunny rabbits. And look, well, there I go. <laughs> and now we turn to something a little bit slower but still brain melty with Slender Threads. This is a kind of horror point and click adventure game. We've arrived in a small town looking for inspiration for our book and to do some light salesman work. But when we stumble across a strange mystery, murder, and disappearing bodies and more, it is up to us to solve things before it's too late for us. This is more on the classical style of point and click adventure. You will be exploring the town, talking to the wide assortment of people, finding lots of MacGuffins, items, doodads, and more, and trying to mix, combine, and match them all to solve the puzzles. The puzzle logic here looks like it's going to be on the classic adventure side, as you'll need to figure out how to MacGyver your way from one situation to the next. I really like the art style of this one, and the story certainly paints a very interesting and weird picture. So if you are a fan of adventure games and looking for a kind of Twin Peaks uh, spooky style one, then definitely check this one out. We now turn to In Stars and Time. This is a RPG Maker style game where you play as a group of friends who have come to end the rule of an evil king. They have stormed the castle and they're going to use the power of friendship and rock, paper, scissors to do so. Unfortunately, as it turns out, something is wrong and you are trapped in a time loop that only the main character can remember. In order to get out, you must keep going from loop to loop, learning more about what is happening, and try to save the day, the world, and your best friends. The game does not feature random encounters as enemies will kind of surprise you. Instead, enemies wander the map, and if they spy you, they will come running. You can kind of de them by running from screen to screen, and they will respawn as well. Combat itself is kind of combat rock, paper, scissors. Each character belongs to one of the three types, and they have attacks related to it or other combinations. Your job is to use the right counter to the enemy. So the enemy is paper based, you want to use scissors obviously. And you'll need to figure out what the enemies are strong and weak to, and then capitalize that for your party. There is of course going to be exploration, items to find, puzzles to solve, and more. And I really like the art style of this one as well. While we didn't get a chance to see too much of the time loop related shenanigans, the story is certainly interesting, the combat is solid, and if you're looking for a very emotionally driven and friendship driven JRPG, then definitely check it out. And for our last game, this is one that I played on my own, and this is Bugaboo Pocket. This is a kind of like Tamagotchi for bugs. After a fire has wrecked a kind of habitat, we have left our job to kind of live in a research lab out there. With one bug to our name, we're going to try and bring life back to the ridge and have some cute and cuddly insect friends as well. The game itself again combines kind of Tamagotchi with mini gameplay. Your bugs will live, frolic, you can feed them, pet them, and do all kinds of things with them including mini games. The mini games are used to reward you with 
currency that you can use to upgrade and update your terrariums, as well as costumes and cosmetics. So if you ever wanted to see bugs with fancy and cool hats, you can do that here. Your mission is to kind of keep raising bugs, keep them happy, and then release them out into the wild so they can live as long as they can until they eventually pass of old age. You'll get more bugs with their own unique quirks, uh, food preferences, and how you want to pet them. And the game, I really do love like the aesthetics of the Tamagotchi as well as the pixel art. Now, if you're looking for kind of bug raising hardcore sim play, this is not going to be that game, as you'll spend most of your time watching your bugs, playing mini games, and that's about it. I don't know how much more advanced it is going to get, but this game is certainly adorable, and if you're not afraid of bugs, and looking for something to relax and watch some uh, critters with, then definitely check it out. And with that, we're done with the Women-Led Games Showcase. Thank you for watching, you'll find links to all the games down below, let me tell you your game for a future stream and showcase. Please reach out. And with that, another kind of festival is done. So until next time, have a great night. That's going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to do the YouTubing stuff people tell you to do. If you're interested in more of my thoughts on design, check out my books wherever they are sold. Visit our Discord and Patreon and come back for detailed discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games.